Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself for the stories making news and moving markets in the APAC region. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business app. China has announced that it will be holding a briefing on Saturday morning uh, on fiscal policy. The state council says that the finance minister will be introducing moves to strengthen fiscal policy. So investors will be expecting some tangible news. Joining us now in our studios is Dan Tenkate, Bloomberg Asia EcoGov executive editor. So we know there's the potential for some disappointment, Dan, uh, but this is actually the, the, the finance ministry and along with the state council, this is where you would get this kind of information. Uh, Are are we expecting much uh, from the minister? And if so, what will some of the details likely be? Yeah, well, certainly the the markets are uh, anticipating real stimulus, some concrete measures, some actual money. Uh, We didn't get that earlier this week with the NDRC. And as you mentioned, the NDRC wouldn't be the the body, the Chinese agency uh, that would um, necessarily give you those hard details. So the finance minister is the one um, in the Chinese system who can deliver on that. And, you know, the market swings uh, that we've seen indicate that there's a real um, urge to see something concrete to keep this rally uh, going. Right now, the way we understand things is that the growth targets remain intact. Could that change, do you think, in any meaningful way? Well, the the Pretty much they, they are, you know, the NDRC, which is China's economic planner, they did indicate that they were on target to hit that uh, GDP target of about 4.8%. The real problem with Chinese, China's economy right now is these deflationary pressures. So even if you hit uh, 5% real growth, if you have deflation of 1%, your, your nominal growth is not growing. And so overall, your economy isn't really moving. In fact, prices are just declining and people are getting poorer, essentially. So that number um, needs to be put into context in that sense. And what economists are looking for is something to get the private sector moving again and to get a bit of inflation, to get um, investment going and to kind of reverse this decline that we've seen to prevent this sort of Japan style deflation that could really eat at, uh, uh, gains in wealth over time. It seems urgent from a market point of view, and it may seem urgent from uh, consumers uh, who are disappointed. And, of course, the authorities don't want people out in the streets. But we just had a guest on that said, um, you know, maybe expect a little bit more patience here. The, the authorities don't want these kind of rapid gains that we've seen in markets. So I wonder if investors are getting themselves a little bit too far out over their skis. Yeah, there, there's definitely a mismatch between official thinking in Beijing and, and investors uh, at the moment. And, you know, volatility is something that Chinese authorities never really like. That What they would prefer is just kind of a slow and steady climb up to the top. But, you know, with the, the, the big headlines flying on the Bloomberg terminal, et cetera, the big market swings that we're used to in the world today, um, that's just not the case. And, and we've seen, you know, a 30% jump over the past couple of weeks. That's, that's getting way ahead of your skis in some sense for what the, the authorities can deliver. So we're just coming back from the Golden Week holiday. Have we been able to look at any high frequency data to see uh, how consumers were behaving in that period? Yeah, there. You know, the consumers. It's not as much as you would want, and I think that that's kind of the problem here is that the cons- Chinese consumer is not um, delivering in a way that is really going to make people have confidence in in China's growth at the moment. Um, and that's you know we're seeing people just tighten their belts across the board. Uh, we've seen you know bankers having to give up bonuses. We've seen salary cuts. We've seen. Uh, prices falling, restaurants giving details or deals on 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 uh, food and and basics. So, um, you know, Chinese people right now they are, are very cautious on spending. Um, you know, the, the hope from the government was in part that the the stock market gains would make people feel a bit richer and help this uh, elusive concept of, of confidence in in the consumer 
But, you know, that is fleeting, as, as we've seen. Markets can rise and they can fall very quickly as well. Dan, it's a little tricky because it seemed like, you know, this has been such a, a long period of decline since uh, 2021 that you needed sort of a shock and awe moment. Uh, and then when you get it, uh, then, you know, when the response is so dramatic that you, you feel that authorities want to go a little bit slower, you can kind of feel their pain a little bit. You would think that just incremental announcements of positive um, moves on the market would be what the doctor ordered. And we did get a little bit more this morning in addition to the announcement about the um, the fiscal stimulus coming via the finance minister about the PBOC and its swamp facility to uh, start appli- uh, accepting applications today from, from funds and insurance companies and, and securities uh, where these institutions can borrow against their holdings and can buy back stock and that sort of thing. Is this something uh, that you're getting positive vibes from from investors? Well, definitely the, the moves on the, from the Chinese authorities, particularly the PBOC, to, to cut rates and add monetary stimulus and to signal like support for stocks in general, um, have, have been seen as positive signals. But I think what people are waiting for is this fiscal firepower uh, from the government, and that has yet to come, and that's why there was some disappointment earlier this week, and that's why there's high hopes uh, for this weekend that the finance minister will deliver. You mentioned earlier the possibility of uh, China kind of mirroring what happened in Japan over three decades, uh, beginning in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Do you think that's underneath? I mean, the fear of that kind of outcome really underneath um, the motivation for, for a lot of the uh, stimulus that we have seen? Yeah, the Chinese authorities have definitely studied the the case in Japan, and there's a lot of different views about whether China is actually heading there or not. There's some key differences, among them uh, the fact that China um, is not as wealthy as Japan was uh, back in the day. Some economists will tell you that makes China's situation even potentially uh, worse now. Uh, But what we're seeing more broadly from China is that they're trying to – deflate the property bubble while also maintaining uh, some growth in these bigger sectors like EVs and solar panels and um, kind of new energy type of stuff. And that's why you see these dueling narratives about how China's domestic economy is falling off a cliff. But at the same time, China's taking over the world on all these major uh, manufacturing things and b- increasing trade tensions all, all around the globe. And so that that's really the, the conundrum is here, is how do they successfully uh, land the plane there and get back to stable growth? The Politburo has pledged to stop housing market declines. Uh, how would you assess the progress on that front? Yeah, they still have more to do. I mean, the the measures that they've released to buy unsold housing in particular have not really caught fire yet. So there's a lot of room to expand that. We might hear more about that on Saturday. Uh, what we're very clear on is that the authorities view um, the drag on property sector as really um, too much. It's kind of, they do want to deflate the property sector, but they don't want it dragging on GDP so much. So all the gains that you're seeing in these other sectors are being way offset. So the view is, okay, if you could put a, if you could stop the bleeding on the property sector, not necessarily even boost it that much, but just stop the the downward spiral, um, then you could stabilize the economy and, and, and the GDP number will look better. Very quickly, Dan, do you think there's uh, the possibility that China could scale back a little bit on its defense spending to have more ammunition, uh, pun intended, to apply on uh, the overall economy? Uh, it's unlikely they would. I mean, they haven't really um, significantly boosted defense spending as a proportion of GDP over the years. And China's expenditures on defense are very opaque anyway, so it would be very difficult to tell whether if, if they're in fact <laughs> doing that yeah. uh, to begin with. Yeah, Dan, thanks very much. Uh, Dan Tenke, Bloomberg Asia EcoGov Executive Editor. Let's get to our guest, Yuting Xiao, macro strategist at State Street Global Markets. Yuting, there are a lot of head, headwind, or rather tailwinds for U.S. equities at the moment. Uh, it seems to be telling a, a pretty positive story, but the valuations are high. That seems to be one of the biggest blocks. If history is your guide, um, you might not feel very comfortable at these levels. So how do we justify these, these levels of valuation? 
Right. Um, so I think given where we are in the, uh, the U.S. equity space, there's still a lot of, I think, positivity from the investor sentiment perspective, um, given that we are um, still in this world where, you know, earnings matter quite a bit. And for the U.S. side, you know, earnings still look to be quite resilient. Uh, and now that you are entering this um, support uh, of rate cutting cycle, that overall is a very friendly environment for equity. So even though, you know, Valuation looks a bit, a bit stretched. Um, you don't really see signs of things start to crack. So there's really uh, not, in, in our views, a lot of reasons to, to pull back from this point. Let's talk a little bit about China. It's hard to ignore the uh, mountain of stimulus measures that the government has unveiled recently and the enthusiasm, short-lived as it may have been in uh, the equity space. Long term now, are, are you positive on China? Do you believe that this stimulus is, is, uh, represents a pivot point? Yeah, I think what we've seen so far is definitely showing there is a, a, a sense of urgency from authorities, and it is a bit of a pivot point when it comes to, you know, the, the last year and a half of piecemeal measures we've seen versus what we've seen uh, this time around of more coordinated, more comprehensive combination of policies to really at least, you know, stabilize the sentiment, arrest the, the weakening momentum. So I think to really achieve the growth target at this point for the year, it's really, uh, we are well in line to achieve that. But, you know, looking beyond that, um, we still need to see more, uh, you know, data to really confirm on the macro side, um, things are recovering, especially from consumers and on the real estate side as well. So I think fiscal policy is going to help, uh, you know, to really make this rally uh, more sustainable and really translate more into the recovery on the macro side. Of course, we will have the Ministry of Finance uh, briefing this upcoming this Saturday. So, you know, yeah. more details to be revealed by then. Do you think that that's kind of a make or break moment in that there was some disappointment after the NDRC? Now, we know that, that that's not the, the, uh, uh, the source, perhaps, of new stimulus, and the Ministry of Finance actually is. Uh, but right. it seems like inv- investors, you know, they may be, if, if, this, if, they don't, if he doesn't deliver on Saturday, you wonder what might happen. Right, right. There is definitely uh, quite a bit of disappointment out of the, of the NDRC briefing where, you know, market was very excited going into it, hoping there's more, you know, to come after the Golden Week holiday, of course. So I, I think to, to some extent, you know, you do need more. I think people have been arguing on the fiscal side there needs, you know, to be done um, on, on the measures. But I think whether it will be a make it or break it moment, we probably wouldn't be that extreme uh, because... I, I think one thing that we need to keep in mind is from the authorities' perspective, they don't necessarily want to think to see things moving too quickly in one direction or the other. Um, the very massive rally we've seen, you know, does uh, show that you know there is this very entrenched bearish underweight in the Chinese space, which is why you see a lot of the short covering, mm. uh, you know, the rally into it. But they don't necessarily want to see things going up 20, 30 percent in, in a, you know in, in a span of one week. And that's not really sustainable you uh, not very healthy either what, what, yeah. what is the house view at state street on chinese equities right now uh, we are neutral at this point. We were underweight um, going into the stimulus measure. And I think for a lot of people, that's similar views as well. I think that they've definitely surprised to the upside when it comes to uh, the overall combination of measures. But in our views, you know, we think at the moment, you know, to chase the rally, you need to see more. Um, but, you know, they have done quite a bit, and that is warranted the upgrade from underweight to neutral. The other one that's a little tricky to figure out is the Japan market. Uh, the Nikkei is pushing 40,000 again now. Uh, it, it seems like uh, there's been a little bit of pressure on the BOJ, and so the BOJ has pulled back on normalizing just yet. But do you have a positive view on Japan or not so much? Um, I think on the uh, the BOJ monetary policy side, you know, we think even though they're taking a bit of a pause um, on the monetary policy normalization, the truth of the matter is we are still in this world where Japan is the outlier within the G10 space, which is still on the hiking path when everyone else has started to cut. Um, so that, you know, looking ahead, um, we are likely to get more, you know, normalization, whether it's the end of this year or heading to next year, uh, because inflation is coming 
coming back. You know, even though growth is not that strong at the moment, um, there's definitely signs of inflation start to to come back to Japan and becoming more sustainable in the system. So that does warrant the further normalization of policy and uh, a higher rate than than where we are at the moment as the terminal. So for the currency side, as a result of that, we are you know in a camp that we think potentially there could be more strengths that coming into the yen. So as a result of that, you know that is going to you know bode a little bit less well for for the equity space. And also you know keep in mind you also have quite a lot of um, this money uh, that potentially can be repatriated back into the Japan market once you start to see JGB yield picking up and rates start to go up. Yeah. Um, so that there can be some r- rotation in that aspect as well. All right, Yu Ting, thanks very much for joining us. Yu Ting Shao, macro strategist at State Street Global Markets. A closer look at markets. The next three days could be very, very interesting in Hong Kong and China. Joining us now is Paul Dobson, Bloomberg Executive Editor for Asia Markets in our studios in Singapore. So we we had this announcement yesterday that um, the finance ministry will address the the public on on Saturday morning, and we'll talk about uh, strengthening fiscal policy. So that's one very big thing. Also today, as of today, the PBOC has set up this swap facility to allow insurance companies and securities firms and funds to uh, borrow to get liquidity uh, against their holdings to buy back shares. And if you're looking for something that is tangible in the market, I mean, a lot of stimulus will help the economy, but is it tangible in markets? This swap facility could be tangible in markets, Paul. So I guess the question is, are we at a turning point here in interpreting how serious they are about stimulus? Hi, hi there, Brian. Um, I think I, it's the it's the right question. I don't know if I have a good answer for you because we still don't have enough details. And that's what the street is really crying out for now. Uh, we heard from policymakers uh, over the past few days saying they're willing to listen to the markets and the marketplace, what companies want, uh, what people and traders and investors need. What they need is more uh, signs, the, uh, the stimulus, not just to support the market, but to support the underlying economy, to bring back that consumer confidence, to uh, revive the property market and we have seen some signs and hints and clues as to it but really what we want to know is how big is this package going to be how extensive is it going to be uh, in order for people to really be to convinced and to carry on uh, buying into this massive uh, upswing that we've seen over the past few weeks of trading around the holiday so uh, that's why the market is so nervous right now it's very interesting to see that this briefing is going to take place on a Saturday yeah. while markets are closed maybe that keeps things a little bit calmer for them to to give those announcements and make sure that they're properly explained uh but the market is still wondering whether we will actually get any figures from that whether it's the finance ministry that is the right place to advance to 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 announce those numbers which are so crucial and which people are waiting to hear paul as you know i mean china has been stuck in this deflationary trap for some time but i'm wondering whether or not historically you can look at a period of time and maybe make an analogy. Is there a time when uh, regulators, authorities in Beijing essentially threw everything and the kitchen sink at the problem to try to, to pivot and, and turn a very bad sentiment in, into something that is a lot more positive? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, uh, the, there's a track record of it. And I think people are almost as worried about how that has led to a kind of overheating of the markets that then turned into a bubble that then burst as they are about uh, the possibility of under delivery, which is what has been the theme over the last few years. So, you know, think about uh, some of those previous stimulus bursts that we've seen going way back uh, into the early part of uh, this millennium and and some of the booms and bust cycles that we've seen. So throwing the kitchen sink at it willy nilly or, or going for, you know, growth based on exports and that kind of thing, old old world stimulus, building white elephant projects. That's not really what people want to see. Yes, it will provide that temporary sugar rush, but it's not going to be sustainable. And okay, so speculators will rush in and jump onto the bandwagon and push those asset prices higher. But what uh, what the rest of the world, what you know, international investors who've taken their money out of China over the past few years want to see is more of a conviction to long-term economic reform and growth, not just 
uh, in terms of manufacturing, which has been extremely successful, but also in terms of uh, consumer uh, well, and pushing that narrative. Well, Paul, the, the market seems a little out of step with what the economy has produced over the past uh, three or four years, because we've seen such a huge dark cloud over over markets in China that, you know, you have a situation where for Hong Kong, for instance, the Hang Seng Index is down from more than 31,000, trading down around the 15, 16,000 level. The CSI 300, you know, down in the 3,000s when it was well up over 5,500 at one point. So it, it does seem that, you know, a lot of this is self-inflicted. I mean, they came out with some very, very powerful uh, anti-private sector policies over the past three years. And maybe this is just a little bit kind of riding the ship a bit. Yes, yeah, writing the ship a little bit. The valuations are still relatively low, even after the rally that we've seen in the past few weeks. Uh, I think that that's really the key um, to the longer term trajectory so so much of our reporting over the last year year and a half has been about international investors you know us pension funds index trackers emerging market investors looking at ways of reducing their holdings of china lowering the benchmark uh weighting that they're using to follow uh china in emerging market indexes or just you know kind of deciding that it's too risky uh and and you know taking holdings all the way to zero. If China wants to bring that international money back, it's got to create a much more stable regulatory framework, much more reliable and much more uh, long term for that sustainable investment flow to come back in. Yeah. And to get you know, consumers feeling at least a little bit comfortable for spending their hard earned dollars. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Paul Dobson, Bloomberg Executive Editor for Asia Markets. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. 